All right, I think, I think we can start. My clock is turned to 9.02 now. All right, so Excellent. welcome and hello everybody. Uh, this is another talk from the uh, Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory Webinar Series 2021. Before we start with the presentation, the talk, I'd like to uh, read out an acknowledgement of country. The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship on, uh, of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So we're very grateful that uh, UQ and um, the land on which it is situated support the Lodal and this webinar series. If you'd like to know more about Lodal, there's the web link to the uh, website. There's also a link to the opening webinar series where you can read more information about the talks and get some more information about uh, what is uh, coming and about the presenters. You can also follow us on Twitter, so you're alerted whenever new presentations are upcoming. And you can contact us anytime via email using uh, slcladal at uq.edu.au. <coughs> it's a real pleasure to introduce Gerald Schneider, um, who's uh, giving today's presentation. Uh, the title of the presentation is The Text Crunching Center, TCC, Data-Driven Methods for Linguists, Social Science and Digital Humanities. Gerold is a senior lecturer, researcher and computing scientist at the Department of Computational Linguistics at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. His doctoral degree is on large-scale dependency parsing. His habilitation is on using computational methods for corpus linguistics. His research interests include corpus linguistics, statistical approaches, digital humanities, text mining, and language modeling. He has published over 100 articles on these topics, and he's published two books. One book uh, on statistics for linguists and a book on digital humanities is underway. So I'm very, very happy to introduce Gerold, who's a very dear friend. I'm very impressed by his work. He's extremely knowledgeable. And so I'm very, very happy to uh, hand over uh, to Gerold now. Thank you. Thank you very much for these kind words. Yes, indeed, your audio was gone for a moment, um, oh, no. but never mind. I mean, you saw it on screen. And uh, yes, alert me should there be um, longer um, lasting um, uh, problems or delays. So I'll now share my screen with you. I assume that you can see it. Yes, Excellent. we do. So I would like to talk to you about the Text Crunching Center, which is a platform that we have um, installed at the University of Zurich in the Computational Linguistics um, Department. We're offering data-driven methods um, for linguists, uh, generally for social science and for on digital humanities and I'll say a few things about the text crunching center and I'll say um, even more about some of the methods and I'll give a couple of um, case studies on the methods that we are using. So what is the text crunching center? We offer expertise in the areas of generally speaking text analytics so um, text mining um, for instance, or um, generally the digital humanities, which is of course a broad area, but also machine translation and depending on what our customers need, a few more things. Um, we have a good business model in which um, we offer some of our services for free and some for paying um, basically in any area of digitalization. So we do processing of text and this can indeed also include historical texts, but also multilingual texts. Switzerland also has a very multilingual 
um, tradition with four national languages and uh, English, of course, um, being, um, uh, it's often referred to as the fifth national language because it's also um, extremely important. And we also give advice on uh, tools, on software and best practices. And uh, of course, um, yes, uh, we are interested in project applications and there we usually um, do write uh, applications with our partners, our business partners, our research partners um, together um, for free. And this can also be a research project um, or um, also um, uh, industrial projects or projects which are, are at um, the interaction between um, industry and uh, research, so porting um, research results into um, industry. Um, and there, however, if the project gets accepted, of course, then um, we do get um, a part of uh, the um, research money and um, execute um, research um, for them. So um, that's one uh, possible model. And we can also program ready-made uh, solutions, either fixed contract or paid per hour. And one other very important part is that we do training and um, coaching. Typically, our partners um, want to be able to use the methods that we are showing to them uh, themselves. So the code that we develop, um, they can then apply and extend and test and yeah, use some new um, data um, afterwards. We offer uh, the same prices that one um, also has to pay um, for research um, projects, um, like what one applies for. Okay, I'd now like to centrally show you some of the methods that we are going to use. This is going to start with telemetry and uh, stylistics, um, then uh, on collocations, particularly I'll show something on learner language, um, document classification, I'll show an application of US politics, um, and then topic modeling is, of course, a favorite method in text analytics, and so is um, sentiment uh, detection. I'll spend quite a lot of time on uh, conceptual maps, which are basically semantic um, maps, semantic landscapes, and uh, say a few things about the underlying um, technology or generally of distributional semantics. Depending on how much time we have, uh, I'll come to cognitive language models, which I think is um, the ultimate um, goal. I want to use models which are also cognitively plausible and from which we can also learn something about uh, how humans deal with language. The first um, part, stylometry and uh, stylistics. So here I'm going to show a study from language use and uh, cognitive aging. I have done this research together with Laura Lohr and Mike Martin. Mike Martin um, is a professor of psychology, both at the University of Zurich and also the University of um, Queensland. Um, so that is another um, reason why this research is um, uh, possibly interesting. Um, eight minute conflict conversations between um, 364 couples were recorded uh, with a very broad um, age range from 19 to um, 82. Um, and uh, some of the topics that they were supposed to discuss uh, were um, given. So uh, there is a bit of um, control, but there are also free uh, sections. We compared um, the language that is used and found, for instance, um, many of these um, results are, of course, also predicted by previous studies that the vocabulary richness increases with age, um, even on to a very high um, age. So 82 years, as our oldest speakers are, that's actually an age group where one has very little research anyway. Then rare words um, are also used uh, more often by um, um, older speakers, but the grammatical structures from a certain moment on get uh, uh, simpler. Again, we'll see that in a brief 
moment. There are more disfluencies with older speakers, of course, more uh, word finding difficulties, as we know. So um, as other research says as well, of course, uh, crystallized intelligence is increasing vocabulary and the world knowledge, while the fluid intelligence and um, working memory, fluency, talking speed, of course, as well, is uh, decreasing. Here is a small excerpt of our um, result. Uh, what we particularly showed is that a linear regression in this case doesn't get you um, uh, the appropriate or the best um, trend and uh, reduction of your uh, data. But if you use um, if you use quadratic linear regression, then you get a better model fit, and this is also um, a more appropriate pace tribute to the reality where disfluencies as are indicated here, and men have far more disfluencies than women, and we see that until the age of about 72 or 70, um, they increase, and then later on, they actually decrease again. Um, one reason why this fluency is decreased is indeed that the syntactic complexity becomes um, smaller. And here we look at clause lengths. Even more here, um, a quadratic um, regression fits uh, better than a linear regression. Around the age of 50 to 60 clause length in um, spontaneous speech is uh, longest, but this is of course spontaneous speech, which is a bit under pressure because um, the couples are supposed to talk about conflicts and um, that they have had in the past, or maybe that they also still have. If you're interested in the full story, I have also given you the um, bibliographical reference to our corresponding paper. Uh, something that I haven't published yet is um, that uh, there is also when it comes to clauses that there's a big difference between subordination and coordination. Subordination that's typical of hypotactic style which um, uh, is used a lot in argumentation and in elaboration. And there we particularly see here you have the color coding that in the oldest um, group something really seems to happen. They have um, far fewer subordinating clauses. Well, if we look at coordinating clauses, um, the differences are um, much smaller, much less remarkable and coordinating clauses are used in paratactic style. They are characteristic of um, narration. We of course know that particularly from children that with this style of and, 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 and so on, but it's also something that happens more with um, older speakers again. When looking at uh, stylistics, one area of research that I also um, did um, partly also related to the question of um, language and age, because it is noticeable that uh, Donald Trump uses a particular language and uh, we couldn't really find any uh, conclusive evidence whether this is age related, but it is noticeable that, for example, Donald Trump's vocabulary richness, which we measure here, that's a type uh, token ratio, so how many um, words um, and how many different words are used, um, a, we measure that on segments of um, 1,000 words, so that's the so-called mean segmental type token ratio. And uh, we looked at the presidential debates from 2000 to 2016. And it is noticeable that the value of Donald Trump is really particularly low. I have also given you the Santa Barbara corpus of um, spoken um, American English here as a reference. And we see that Donald Trump even falls um, below that line. Something else that I looked at in Donald Trump's language, it is um, really noticeable that he overuses the pronoun I um, more than any other um, candidate in 
the presidential debates. He has also relatively low use of we, but um, not even very much so. Um, Barack Obama was the only one who in his second um, uh, debate used, um, his uh, second um, run uh, used more we than I. The pronoun I is often a sign of eccentricity. Of course, not every instance is, but um, it's a clear sign. In blogs, for instance, it's also noticeable that I is used extremely much because they tend to border on the um, monologues, while we is often a sign of inclusiveness. Um, again, not necessarily, but we can see some of uh, these trends. And if one does research like this, one also ends up in the news um, fairly quickly. So this was um, an article in uh, the newspaper Blick, which is basically the Swiss reference to the German build um, um, newspaper. Um, so if you're conducting research, and I think that's um, also gratifying if one is conducting research in um, such an area of linguistics, one actually can actually make it into the news. Um, I'd now like to come to my second uh, topic, collocations. Here, um, one of the things that we want to do in digital humanities is um, really um, help language learners, but we also want to investigate cognitive reasons for why it is difficult to learn a language, um, what types of errors occur, um, and also what uh, differences are between learner language and um, outer circle um, and L2 varieties. And for this, we have um, looked at uh, particularly um, verb preposition constructions. Yeah, you again have the reference here. And uh, so what we looked at, what we looked to uh, try to find are constructions like the following one. They have to cope with life's problems and difficulties and to realize the reasons why they decided to get involved into and um, crime. So what happens here is that uh, well, it should, of course, be involved um, in and in is basically a phrase. So, um, uh, but here this in, which doesn't really have any directional force per se, is interpreted as literally having directional force, and that is even further um, strengthened. So um, these, yes, uh, on the one hand, that's an error, but um, on the other hand, uh, it's also very interesting because um, how do uh, language learners deal with the cognitive um, challenges uh, of learning a new language and, of course, of suffering from uh, transfer and um, analogies. So um, we find that interesting in addition to wanting to help uh, the learners. So uh, English as a foreign language, um, features are more than just typos, but they're really lexical grammatical patterns. And those which are repeated frequently enough indeed actually reach collocational um, uh, status. And then we can also investigate whether they could be due to L1 transfer or um, due to cognitive and uh, semantic um, analogies. The type of error that we looked at, um, namely um, idiomatic expressions and prepositions, are really fairly um, frequent. So um, these are, um, uh, according to a study, the three most frequent error types by learners of English. Prepositions are also interesting because they actually exhibit a high rate of innovation. So the system is less stable than what we sometimes uh, think, in particular in English as a second language. So for instance, in Indian English, um, many new um, combinations have been found. And of course, uh, in EFL um, as well. Um, something that I'm not going to focus on this task in this talk, but you can also find that in the article. We've really also looked at um, similarities between ESL and uh, EFL. And for instance, what you saw before this involved into um, is also something that one finds a lot in, in English as a second language um, varieties. Routinization is, of course, particularly difficult for learners, as the McHenry and Xiao quote here um, stresses. They say a focus of the lexical approach to language pedagogy is teaching collocations. Such knowledge is evidently more important than individual words themselves. 
When I say verb plus preposition, I also include phrasal particles on the preposition side and adjectives um, on the verb side. So, so things like um, uh, able to um, and so on. Uh, uh, we will see some um, errors and problems in that area in a moment. First, a brief reminder of what collocations are or how they are um, calculated. I'm not going to present the linguistic um, a background, but I'll present one simple collocation metric, namely observed over expected, observed divided by expected, or also known as O over E. And uh, that uh, works as follows. If words just um, occurred in a complete random order, then, uh, well, two words, let's call the first one X and the second one Y, um, then the sequence of X immediately followed by Y would just be the probability of the two independent events. The probability of seeing the word X times the probability of seeing the word Y. Well, if you throw the dice, you know that you, you, the chance of getting a six is one sixth, and the chance of getting a six again after that is uh, also one sixth. So um, uh, it's uh, one um, divided by um, 36. Now, in reality, however, so um, this is basically our expectation. It's a DOM expectation model. And we want to know in reality, um, does that hold or how much more do words actually really occur together? So that's the actual measurement, the observed value. And for this, we can, of course, from logical goals, just extract the probability of X really being followed by Y. Yes, and uh, if the collocation, the co-occurrence of two words is uh, by chance, then uh, for those words, X and Y, where um, these two are roughly similar, we of course have no collocational force, but if um, it's bigger and if it's much bigger, um, then we have a strong collocation. Some people um, calculate this, uh, that's it's then called uh, mutual information um, in bits. Uh, so that's then uh, the log uh, logarithm to the base two, and then it's an information theoretic measure. But the ranking that we get from the strongest to the uh, less strong collocations is exactly the um, same. So yes, the formula is really fairly um, trivial. Uh, we've uh, played around with various um, collocation um, metrics. Um, I'm actually um, mainly going to show uh, the um, T-score um, metric to you, but our ovary um, also works reasonably well. Okay, now this is collocations. And I mean, what we are particularly interested, yes, we want to find um, speaker collocations, uh, learner collocations with verb and prepositions that are frequent enough to reach collocational status. There should be collocations in L2, but, and this is the tricky part, there should be no collocations in L2. One. And if you just measure collocation metrics, uh, then we fail to see the set part. So what we invented and used is what I call the uh, collocation ratio, where we uh, take the collocation metric that we get from the learner corpus, whichever metric that be, and we divide it by the collocation metric that we get for the same words from um, a native speaker corpus. We've used uh, as L2 corpus, um, mainly uh, the ICL corpus, the National Corpus of Learner English from the uh, University of Louvain. And um, as the reference L1 corpus, we've used the British National Corpus. This, by the way, is in itself an uh, well, it's a measure of over collocability, um, or you could say it's, a, it's itself an O over E measure. So what we observe is the collocation metric that we get from the learner language, but what we expect is the collocation metric from the L1. Here are some of the results that we get. There are far more tables, of course, in uh, the reference. So uh, there are many um, writers in essays uh, that they have written 
who use impose two when they mean impose on or who use replace two when they mean replace by accuse four when they mean accuse of well here we can see accusation at the certain the pattern um, from the noun is uh, partly uh, flowing in and so on i'm not going to go through this entire list perhaps this one discuss about instead of discuss something is um a favorite or some uh, an, a problem that every um, teacher of English um, uh, knows. Uh, there, are, there are also a couple of um, others and you also see many adjectives here. So afraid about instead of afraid of etc. This is just the very top of the list. Um, you can go through this list and we actually really found hundreds um, of new um, combinations in the case of learner language or of, uh, uh, sorry, the errors um, in the case of learner language or new combinations in the case of outer circle varieties and as many of them overlap, this indeed also raises the question of to which point one can really speak um, of errors and of uh, um, new novel ML2 combinations if they are um, partly the same. We can then also uh, categorize these by um, uh, which reason comes in. I mentioned that sometimes uh, the uh, noun pattern is just um, use. Um, then sometimes it's an analogy because it's all a bit tricky. So um, uh, independent on, if speakers say that, they of course think of dependent on, and it's really quite tricky that it's actually independent of. Um, again, of course, there are also people who uh, just say yes, dependent um, or dependent of or dependent from or whatever. So that's of course also an, an analogy due to um, literal interpretation of the preposition, um, well, which is in fact a phrasal particle that we um, get. And then um, uh, when speakers, for instance, um, learners, for instance, um, write um, to separate between their influence by distinguish um, between and things like that, or if they um, write to arrive to, they might um, um, have the pattern of to get to in um, mind. There are, of course, also language-specific influence particularly with Roman speakers, we've noticed um, that inherent uh, to instead of inherent in is often used because, um, uh, for instance, in French, inherent à, um, uh, the preposition à, which generally expresses the dative, is basically used whenever we have, um, or often when we have something like a um, dative. In our method, we detected um, typical errors from a totally unannotated um, corpus, and that was interesting. And of course, um, most of the verb preposition uses are um, correct, but some of them show these patterns, and we could detect um, these. We're now going over to the next um, method. So we're um, so far, we have also used um, linguistic methods um, or methods that the linguists find particularly useful. Collocations are also a method that can also be used for um, uh, discovery of uh, content, um, so for media content analysis. Um, it's a method that stays very much at the surface, um, close to the text, which is good, but at the same time, it needs very much um, interpretation because you need to go through um, a very long um, texts. We're now introducing methods that um, abstract a bit more. The first one is document classification. It's an extremely versatile method, um, according to some media content analysts, Grimmer and Stewart, for instance, for the introductory article to the media and content analysis subject, really placed this one as the central method um, classification. How can we um, do a classification? Well, under the hood in the background, we use a so-called um, vector space rep representation, which uses a document term matrix, which I would briefly um, like to introduce. So say we have um, 
just uh, three keywords that we're looking at. Of course, in reality, one has more, but um, we use three here because then we get a three-dimensional space, which we can still um, imagine. And we would also have three documents. Say in our document one, the word market um, occurs twice. So we have a dimension into for, for market into which we step um, two uh, uh, units. And then computer occurs eight times, so uh, we go eight times into the computer direction, and government occurs once, so um, here we are, and this is our representation for document one in the vector space. You already see here that um, document two and document three are much closer to each other. And this is then also used for document um, classification. I've used this, uh, for instance, uh, on a political um, uh, subject um, where I used a large corpus of US speeches. This is before Donald um, Trump. So the question was, if you just have the speech, can you predict whether this is a Republican or a Democrat um, speaker? Um, I've used, um, here we have the list of the speakers, of course, and we um, exclude uh, Margaret. Uh, Satcha, for example, because she wasn't an American um, politician. And one actually gets um, uh, 95 to 98% uh, accuracy with, um, uh, for instance, uh, the logistic and regression model using such a vector space representation. What we are particularly interested in here, um, once you have a good accuracy, is that you can then interpret the features. And if we look at the um, most typical Republican features, you can do that in several ways. Here we look at the F um, score, then you see contractions. And so uh, the intention is really to present a spoken language. It's one of us um, idea. And of course, we find the usual um, culprits um, and those terms that we would probably expect to be overused by Republican American politicians, such as nation, men, um, Y'all, that's the Southern states feature freedom, great, uh, that was already there before Trump, um, government, America, military, and so on. Again, this is just the top of the list. You can go through that a lot. Um, on the other side of the scale, and for this, I have used um, those features which are least Republican. So F score um, is smaller. So these are features which hardly ever point to a Republican article. So here we have the National Rifle Association. Questions are about climate or equal pay, racial, whatever. Um, I'm not going through the entire list, of course, but uh, you can see that um, things like uh, fugitives, um, stalkers, um, student loans and toxic waste are um, yeah, swept under the rug um, more by the Republican um, Party. Um, feature lists that we get from such document classification are useful, but um, we have to go through this very long list. Again, this is just the top. So the method cannot abstract from words to concepts. What can we do? And one method that is often used uh, in topic models um, can uh, is alleged to be able to do so. It's a method which on the one hand, um, like in document classification, uh, it describes how a, doc how a document uh, belongs to a certain topic. Um, but we know that different topics, of course, also generate different words. The documents and the words are given in this unsupervised um, method, but the topics are exactly the classes um, are exactly not given. They are um, discovered completely from uh, the uh, data. Um, in, in order to achieve this mix, um, literally what is maximized is on the one hand, this is the um, document classification part, uh, the probability of a topic given a document, um, but also um, at the same time, the probability of this topic generating the words um, that we have is also maximized. And this method is quite good at revealing semantically related subject areas and associations. It delivers both topics and keywords, completely data driven, as I have said, it's domain dependent, it's language independent. If you have enough data, it supports any level of granularity. And I think generally that these methods are particularly when we come to talk about the um, underlying methods, distributional semantics, 
And this is really the dream of Ferdinand de Saussure's difference, where words are not defined uh, by what they are, but by, uh, they are defined by what they are not in contradistinction and in similarity to other words. We can apply these topic models, and one um, thing that we have applied it to is the British Parliamentary Debates Hansard Corpus, where we then get uh, suggested uh, topics, and we can um, do time series um, analysis on these topics. So um, just a few examples. We can see, for example, that topic which obviously deals with Ireland. Here it is um, in blue was as strongest around 1890 or 1900 when they had um, the big unrest and Ireland becoming independent and in World War I there were still relatively many Irish soldiers um, but afterwards the interest dropped off um, completely and of course World War II um, around 1940 so this is totally um, expected. I'll show you some of the key words which allowed us to manually guess which topics um, are um, present in a moment. We were particularly interested in democratization um, processes um, and here we have for instance uh, transportation topics and energy topics so we'll come to talk about them in a brief moment um, but of course education is extremely important for democratization we see that um, mandatory education was uh, really a particularly important and introduced in the 1850s and universities many of them were founded here in the 1870s then there are other aspects such as um, the unions and work and labor which um, uh, well, here we had a general strike in actually several countries um, after World War I, and of course, uh, so uh, social unrest. Um, but we have other factors which are important here, such as pension and benefit, or um, more lately, health and medicine is getting more and more important. Um, one thing that is always important is how one evaluates uh, topic models and one way in which we did that or what was our interest we wanted to find out correlations to real democracy indices and that's um, what we did on the top we have um, topics that have um, uh, no or rather a um, negative correlation um, it's no surprise and here we really see keywords that are presented it's no surprise that um, this topic um, which is indeed about um, slavery has a very strong negative correlation to democracy because of course in a, a, a country which has slavery I mean, the, you cannot talk of um, um, democracy some of the positively correlated um, topics and I'm not going through um, all of them here for example you have the trade unions and strikes that I have um, referred to here you have um, the energy uh, topic that I have um, referred to which is really very strongly correlated and this is in a way um, interesting or slightly unexpected um, and this gives a new meaning to the catchphrase power to the people. So it can also be if you give people electrical um, um, power or oil power, then that indeed leaves them more time to deal with um, uh, democratic questions and form an informed um, opinion. Uh, information society, which we see here, is of course also very strongly correlated. Here we've used um, 100. Um, uh, topics and then um, uh, we here report those which were more interesting and again you have the reference this um, paper should come out very soon. Um, another uh, thing that we have investigated quite a lot is uh, migration. Here um, just a short moment ago um, we gave a presentation at the um, approaches to migration and linguistic um, identity conference. We looked at ideologies surrounding migration and here particularly in the social media. We've used Twitter um, tweets from the US, Britain, Ireland, South Africa, and yes, also um, Australia. If, uh, we used um, large newspapers and uh, opinion makers and then followed um, and then their followers and there we uh, took a large random 
um, selection and we wanted to find out, yes, which ideology, ideologies are there, what international differences exist and are the findings also related to population surveys. Um, again, uh, correlation evaluation is really important. The correlation to the survey data is plotted here. We have really quite a high um, correlation um, except for in South Africa. So generally we have correlation of um, 0.6 um, Spearman um, correlation there, which is quite high. Um, if we remove South Africa, because that's really an outlier, we even get up to 0.9. And of course, we wanted to know why is South African outlier and what are people um, negative about? And that's what we're looking at in a moment here. We have also a uh, representation where we can see uh, that so here we have the more negative sentiment and here we have the more positive sentiment and we see that um, indeed um, uh, South Africa is a very um, negative um, while the UK and Australia are still quite um, negative uh, while New Zealand and Ireland are more and positive so what surrounds the negative sentiment and for this we have used various methods such as topic models, um, and in particular, and this is um, another important method I'd like to briefly introduce, conceptual maps. Um, in conceptual maps, we look at co-occurrences of words in a very large um, context. So for instance, if in the British National Corpus, we look at whore, um, which is in yellow here, so these are the frequencies, and um, when we cut the BNC into several hundred snippets um, and a ride in a blue. And we see that, um, yes, the co-occurrence is indeed a lot bigger than it would be if we just had um, a random situation. But it's not perhaps as high as we had expected. Um, but we would do this systematically just on all um, words. The maps that we can then get, and here we have one exactly from the migration domain that I have uh, alluded to, and I have left some of the meta information in. So here we have um, the American US was unfortunately we did out because that's of course a stop word, but here we see um, whatever we expect to be uh, there, and we see that the South African cluster. Um, here is extremely closely related to the US American one. And that's also uh, the key to why uh, South Africa is an outlier, because if we then look at the tweets, um, there are very many negative tweets, not about um, only uh, immigration to South Africa, or they also exist, but there are very many negative tweets on the situation of how um, Africans generally um, are treated, um, particularly um, in the US and, and uh, particularly, well, that's why POTUS is actually a, a, a president of the US, Donald Trump then actually even ends, or largely then in, even ends up still in the South African um, cluster. We can also zoom in on a couple of different, um, here, here we have New Zealand, for instance, which is not too far away from Australia, um, but um, has a slightly different focus. And in Australia, um, uh, we have, um, yes, quite strong words, of course, like the um, well, uh, Australian police, that's uh, less um, um, problematic, but um, uh, the way that um, potential immigrants are treated, the detention on the island, which is seen as a torture method. Um, so this um, really shows up quite clearly if one uh, looks at um, the maps of associations as we do. Here, um, I will um, not show all the slides, of course, but just a couple of um, more examples. Conceptual maps for one customer. We also did that was a customer from the food industry on the differences between wine, cider, and beer. And we see in this corner. Um, that's the wine, which is of course served in glasses. It's red or it's wine. Um, aged wine is good. It comes in bottles and it makes you sleepy. Um, it's also very cozy. That's why. Although, okay, you eat um, 
high class food. So that's why cooking and dinner is here. Um, in particular, this in the uh, night is also a relatively feminine topic. That's why mom and girl um, are um, here. If we move over to beer, that's a very male topic. Here we have guy and mom. It's often related to football. Um, of course, um, it should be uh, served cold, and that's why it's uh, that, that's why the fridge and cold um, is here. If you eat anything, then it's probably just pizza, and um, it's much more related to parties and so on. Uh, there's also a good bit of swearing going on. That's why we have um, fuck here. The one which is most different from the others is um, cider, however, which is very seasonally related. That's why we have autumn and fall here. Um, often experiments with spices such as cinnamon um, are made. And of course, um, yes, the orchard where you pluck them are important. Um, uh, other seasonal growths such as, as pumpkins and many people actually, particularly in the US, also produce pumpkin cider and our commercial partners said, okay, that this is actually an idea, we could um, look at this more and perhaps introduce pumpkin cider as a novelty into the um, European market to see if this um, works. Um, there's a lot more I could say on conceptual maps. We also used them on historical events here, for instance, the um, Koha Corpus um, from the Corpus of Historical American English from the 1940s, which of course has a very large cluster on World War II. So here you see Japan and the Pearl Harbor attacks, which of course from the American perspective are really a traumatic event, but you also have German attacks um, over here, or you have adverse weather conditions, which, um, for instance, in the um, uh, Russian um, involvement played an extremely important role. But we also see very many other um, topics in um, life continued. Uh, so, for instance, down here we have a farming um, cluster um, so life um, uh, has many aspects also in times of the war, the politics and the farming and the strikes and, um, um, continue. As time is advancing, I think I'll largely leave it at that. I would like to point out that the underlying method of distributional semantics um, still offers a lot more, it can be used in many different ways, different types of maps can also be drawn and this is something that I um, want to explore in the future. As I feared, um, I have to skip largely um, uh, the cognitive modeling part, um, but generally um, I think a good model should be parsimonious and obtain a good prediction of human cognitive behavior. I also always want to learn something about human um, cognition. And there is also still, I think, a good bit of a potential construction. Grammar, of course, knows that there are very many um, uh, levels in the interactions, but we think that um, uh, even uh, binary predictions such as the date of shift um, fall a bit short because um, the human mind does not decide uh, just at such individual points, but we take thousands of decisions every second when we either produce speech or listen to someone and try to disambiguate what um, the speaker, um, yeah, as in this case, for instance, me, is actually um, bringing across and wants to say. So um, I have uh, come to the end um, and I would like to conclude as follows. So I have shown you stylometry and stylistics where we looked at language and age and how that quadratic linear regression is really needed. In learner language, we have been able to explore transfer and cognitive analogies and also a bit of the difference between um, outer circle varieties and learner varieties. We introduced feature weights, where we're not the only ones doing so, but it's still an underused method, feature weights as a keyword metric. 
Um, we've used topic modeling, you know, which indeed allow one to step partly from words to concepts. Um, showed that there is a correlation to metadata such as democratic indices, and we can use that for history and society. We um, looked at uh, sentiment detection, which is, of course, a very famous approach, but um, I think there are far more good methods, but sentiment detection showed us international differences and good correlations to survey data. And then I really like conceptual maps to which I gave you um, an introduction. They allow one to get a very good overview and explore large data sets, but of course one needs to interpret them. The underlying method generally of distributional semantics offers still a lot more, so we can then explore further um, methods. And yes, ultimately, I want to build cognitive language models. And that's it from my side. Um, I hope that we will have time for questions now. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, question and answers now. <laughs>